adult is important because while games and violent games might have an impact on some children, it likely does not have a larger overwhelming effect or at least more of an effect than things like guns. I don't know. What do you think? All right. Um, and the, so the last part we need to go to is number four. And so what would number four be? Conclusion. It's your conclusion, exactly. And so what this means. And this is the most important part of any debate, is determining the what this means or answering the what this means question. And so what that is asking you to do is as a debater, as you sort of engage the debate, you have to develop, well, a calculus for the audience, the judge, whoever is making their own decision about the debate that's happening. You need to give them criteria for how they ought to evaluate the arguments that are being engaged. Does that make sense? It's like, I mean, if you come to a class and the teacher's like, I'm going to give you a grade at the end of this class, but I'm not going to tell you how I come to that grade. How likely are you to know successfully how to get an A in that class? Not so much. And so, to be terribly honest, you need to do the same thing in a debate. Is you need to tell the audience how they ought to be grading the people and the arguments that are inside of that debate. Does that make sense? And so it allows you to develop an overwhelming case for why your evidence, why your reasoning, for example, trumps their historical example. And so you would suggest, well, in this instance, reasoning is more important. So this reasoning is a larger reasoning that ends up with a broader conclusion. And so it allows us to trump that specific historical example that my opponent's talking about. And so I would say that in a larger totality, it makes more reason, uh, draws a larger sort of reasoning and a more likely conclusion to suggest that uh, people are more products of their environment because they have a lot more interaction with their environment. It happens a lot longer than the, the development of a human being, nine months, whatever. And so by, by principle, it suggests that the nurture should be more important than nature. Well, if someone has a historical example that says, Nature clearly, you know, trumps nurture. Is that despite the fact that you might try to suggest to a child they should do this, they'll always do this because it's evolutionary and sort of a biologically embedded sort of desire. And I, you might say, well, that specific instance is trumped by my larger logical conclusion, and so you should prioritize the reasoning of, listen, it just makes more common sense to all of us that we are products of our environments. Is that if you put, I mean, imagine you're having a bad day and you. You know, you, it's raining outside, you wake up, it's a bad day, it's raining outside, you're fighting with your significant other, your friend comes up and says, I don't like you anymore, you stink, and you're like, what's going on here? Your day's probably not getting any better. That is a product largely of environmental factors, which largely would probably suggest that what? It's your environment. Environmental factors are more important than, than necessarily bio, biology or genetics. And so does that make sense? Is that you have to create sort of a navigational system for the audience to conclude as to why you win. And so very quickly, let's return back to this nature versus nurture. Actually, I got a better one. We'll talk about gender. Is gender, well, at least uh, as we sort of know, the gender roles, are those biological? Are they evolutionary sort of, of, of ends? Or are they merely cultural, social concepts? Well, gender, I think, reflects um, our biological sex organs, but I mean, as far as uh, as far as the cultural things, I think it has a lot to do with that too. Because gender roles, when you think of like, hey, this girl, this boy, you know, it has a lot to do with society too. So that's also an environmental factor. Okay. How about an even more specific question? Athletics are athletics determined by gender? someone's proclivity or success at athletics. And so, well, for example, you know, why has the, the US military only had men serving for a long time until not too long ago? Because they feel like they're more physically capable. Are they more physically capable? I don't actually believe that. Anybody willing to take the stance to say that, that men are more physically capable? Ooh. Go for it. Let, well, let's, why? Research has shown that um, in certain instances, men are superior in that sense. 
that's a really bad word to use. Well, that was but, sort of an interesting but, word to yeah. use. <laughs> in in um, certain aspects, though, in physically demanding things, men are more geared for. Okay, well, so let's back to the question then. Is that gearing a product of biology or is that a product of culture? I mean, is the reason why men are more superior to women, quote unquote, is because of, of centuries of social constructs that push men to be more physically active and women to be less so. And so the reason why today we have men being more natural and able to do basic hard labor is because that's a product of, of we've bred that into ourselves. And that's a part of social culture. Social has produced biological change, not biology has produced social change. What do you think about that? I also think like how sometimes like our society pushes like our gender roles, like men are supposed to be working in the back of the family, whereas another is supposed to stay at home and take care of the child. And I think throughout history that's shown that women are more of a nesting, but they like to to nurture and do that for their, their children and take care of the household that they live where men goes out and provides their family. Um, so I think society influences overall because like to certain women they I guess they get it into their head that they can't do what men can do because that's how society is Interesting. Interesting. Anybody think that's incorrect? Well, then there's no debate. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but nevertheless. Oh, clearly you're right because nobody agrees. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works, right? You mentioned this bandwagon thing earlier, Kate. Uh, whatever. Anyways. And so to sort of draw it full circle, is the importance here is to be able to identify strategies for you, for your research, to know what kind of arguments you need to make, how to make more compelling arguments, and how to draw those conclusions, hopefully logical conclusions, for your audience, or for the judge, or for whoever is making the ultimate decision about the nature of your debate. And so to finish this off, what are some things that you can utilize to increase the likelihood of your finding qual uh, qualified, credible research? And so what resources do you have access to as an LR student that you should be starting off with, maybe rather than starting off with Google? Yeah, what? The library book. Oh my gosh, what? <laughs> that, that place exists? I thought that was like an urban legend. There's a humongous place with tons of books? No way. You should check out the library. What else does the library have that you should use? They also have like, certain databases. Electronic resources. So things like EBSCOhost, things like ProQuest, all of those are excellent resources for you to start drawing upon credible research to develop evidence. And those things will also point you towards historical examples that will probably hopefully inspire personal examples so that you can determine whether or not the criteria you're evaluating are significant at the end of the day. It also hopefully will help you draw logical reasoned conclusions to help make the ease of your debate practical and true. So, thank you. Hope, uh, I wish you all the best.